and the title of the book is called Praying the Bible by Ron Donald S. Whitney. And the first chapter, I think it, I read the first two chapters. One is titled The Problem and the other is titled The Solution. Okay, here's a quote from John Piper. All right, this is the problem. <clears throat> if I try to pray for people or events without having the word in front of me, guiding my prayers, then several negative things happen. One is that I tend to be re very repetitive. I just pray the same things all the time. Another negative thing is that my mind tends to wander. That's John Piper. Since prayer is talking with God, why don't people pray more? Why don't people of God enjoy prayer more? I maintain that people truly born again, genuinely Christian people often do not pray simply because they do not feel like it. And the reason they don't feel like praying is that when they do pray, they tend to say the same old things about the same old things. When you've said the same old things about the same old things about a thousand times, how do you feel about it? Saying them again. Did you dare think the B word? Yes, Ford. Can we, we can be talking to the most fascinating person in the universe about the most important things in our son, in our lives and be bored to death. As a result, a great many Christians conclude it must be me. Something's wrong with me. If I get bored in some thing that as important as prayer, then I must be a second rate Christian. Indeed, why would people become bored when talking with God, especially when talking about that which is most important to them? Is it because we don't love God? Is it because deep down we really care nothing for the people or matters we pray about? No, rather, if this mind wandering boredom describes your experience in prayer, I would have argued that if you were indwelled by the Holy Spirit, if you were born again, then the problem is not you, it is your method. Uh, the next section is titled, The Spirit's Present Prompts Prayer. Notice that very important condition. If you are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, but no method will in live in prayer for a person who isn't indwelled by the Holy Spirit. Such a person has no sustained appetite for prayer, no long-term desire for it. When God brings someone into a relationship with him, with himself through Christ, through Jesus Christ, he begins to live within that person by means of his Holy Spirit. As Apostle Paul writes to the to followers of Jesus in Ephesians chapter one, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believe in him, were sealed with the promise, promised Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, Paul also reassures believers in Christ. Your body is a temple of, of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. Just as you bring your human nature with you whenever you enter any place, so whenever the Holy Spirit enters any person, he brings his holy nature with him. The result is that all those in whom the spirit dwells have new holy hunger. Sorry. The result is that all those in whom the spirit dwells have new holy hungers and holy loves they did not have prior to his indwelling presence. The hunger for the Holy Spirit of Holy Word of God which they used to find boring or irrelevant, 1 Peter 2 and 2. They love fellowship with the people of God, finding um, it unimaginable 
to live apart from meaningful interaction with them. First John 3, 14. Hearts and minds in which the Holy Spirit dwells feel holy longings unknown to them previously. They long to live in the holy body without sin, yearn for a holy mind, no longer subject to temptation, groan for a holy world filled with holy people and earnestly desire to see at last the face of one of the angels call holy, 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 Revelation 4, 8. This is the spiritual heartbeat of 100% of the hearts where the spirit of God lives. Any person may be just nine years old, but if the Holy Spirit has come to him or higher or her, then these hungers and desires are planted there, expressed in nine-year-old ways, of course, but they live, but they live there because he lives there. And a person may be 99 with the heart entrusted encrusted by the traditions of the experiences of the years, but pulsing underneath is the ever fresh, evergreen work of the Holy Spirit manifested in every person who dwells, whom he dwells. And according to the New Testament letters of both the Romans and Galatians, another of the supernatural heart changes the Spirit creates in all Christians is to cause them to cry, Abba, Father. Romans 8, Galatians 4 and 6. Thus, when someone is born again, the Holy Spirit gives that person new fatherward desires, a new heavenward orientation, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. In other words, all those spirit, all those indwelled by the Holy Spirit really want to pray. The Holy Spirit causes all the children of God to believe that God is their father and fills them with an undying desire to talk to him. So this next section is called, um, Something Must Be Wrong With Me. Nevertheless, while this spirit produced passion is pushing against one side of our soul, colliding with that is our experience. And our experience says, but when I pray, frankly, it's boring. And when prayer is boring, we don't feel like praying. And when we don't feel like praying, it is hard to make ourselves pray. Even five or six minutes of prayer can feel like an, an eternity. Our mind wanders half the time. We'll suddenly come to ourselves and think, now where was I? I haven't been thinking of God for the last several minutes. And we'll return to the mental script we've repeated countless times, but almost immediately our minds begin to wander again because we've said the same old things about the same old things so many times. It must be me, we concluded. Prayer isn't supposed to be like this. I guess I'm just a second rate Christian. No problem is almost certainly not you. No, sorry, no, the problem is almost certainly not you. It's your method. If you have turned from, the, from living for yourself and your sin, and have trusted Jesus Christ and his work to make you right with God. God has given you the Holy Spirit. And if you are seeking to live under the Lordship of Jesus Christ and the authority of God's word, the Bible, confessing known sin and fighting the lifelong tendency to sin instead of excusing it, then the problem of boredom is prayer, not you. Rather, it is your method. And the method of most Christians in prayer is to say the same old things about the same old thing. After 40 years of experience in ministry, I am convinced that this problem is almost universal. Virtually from the beginning of their Christian life, it seems that nearly every believer suffers from this habit. When prayer consists of the same spoken sentences on every occasion, naturally we wonder at the value of the practice. If our prayers bore us, um, do they also bore God? Does God really need to hear me say these things again? We can begin to feel like a little girl I heard about. Her parents had taught her the classic bedtime prayer for children. That begins, now I lay me down to sleep. 
One night she thought, why does God need to hear me say this again? So she decided to record it herself saying the prayer. And then she played the recording each night when she went to bed. Perhaps you might smile at her story, but you have prayer recordings in your head. They are just a little longer or more sophisticated. Recorded in your memory are prayers, your own or uh, prayers of others. You can repeat mindlessly. I pastored a church in Chicago, in the Chicago area for almost 15 years. During the worship service, one Sunday morning, the usher came forward to receive the offering. And one of the ushers was asked to pray. As the man was praying, I could hear someone else talking. I thought surely this person will stop in a moment. Then I realized it was a child. I said to myself, some adult will quiet this child any second now. But as the talking continued, I opened my eyes and I saw the second row, the, 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 I saw in the second row, the five-year-old son of the usher who was praying. Soon it became obvious that the little boy was praying the same words as his dad, not repeating after him, but in unison with him. It was like when, it, it was like when entire congregations pray the Lord's prayer in unison. Instead, this was a father and son praying dad's prayer. How could such a little boy do that? It was because every time his dad prayed, whether at the Lord's supper table, at the church, or at the supper table at home, his dad prayed the same prayer. The boy who had been in the world only 60 months and he had already memorized everything his dad said when he prayed. He could say the words of the prayer, but most of what came out of his mouth was just a repetition of what were to his five-year-old mind, empty phrases. There may be people in your own family or your church or somewhere in your background who, when they were or are called upon to pray, you could give the prayer because you've heard it so many times. Our hearts don't soar when we hear such praying. We just politely endure it. One prayer does not a prayer life make. Prayers without variety eventually become words without meaning. Jesus said that to pray this way is to pray in vain. For in the Sermon on the Mount, he warned, when do you pray? Don't, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for many words, for their many words, Matthew 6 and 7. The tragedy is that too often, that's the way it is when our prayers, uh, with our prayers. We believe in prayer and the spirit of God prompts us to pray. But because we always say the same old things about the same old things, it can seem as though all we do in prayer is simply heap up empty phrases. Although this drains most of the motivation from talking with God, we dutifully try to grind out another round of prayer. Yet our minds constantly wander from the words, wander from the words, and we condemn ourselves as spiritual failures. Next section is titled, Praying About the Same Old Things is Normal. Notice carefully, for this, very, for this is very important, that the problem is not that we pray about the same old things. To routinely pray about the same people and situations is perfectly, is perfectly normal. It's normal to pray about the same old things because our lives tend to consist of the same old things. For example, if I came to your church or Bible study group and randomly selected a handful of people, including you, then ask each person to get alone and spend the next five to 10 minutes in prayer, I'm confident that nearly every person um, in the group would pray about the same half dozen things. Each person would likely pray about his or her family in one sense or another. Married people would pray for their spouses. Singles might pray to be married. Parents would pray for their children and so forth. Doubtless, everyone would pray about their future, perhaps asking for direction about some decision 
such as a change in work or whether to move to a new place, or their prayer might be about an upcoming event or some life change that's on their horizon. It is likely that all would pray about their finances, seeking God's provision for that car, for those bills, um, or for school. Most would pray about their work, or if a students, oh, if students, they pray in some way about their schoolwork. It's normal for people to pray in regard to what they spend most of their waking hours do, doing during the week. Each of these believers would probably pray about some Christian concern, such as something related to their church or to the personal ministry involvement with someone. Possibly they would pray for a brother or sister in Christ who is suffering or for someone with whom they are trying to share the gospel. And then each one would almost certainly pray about the current crisis in his life, in his or her life. I've read that each of us experiences a relatively significant crisis on average of once every six months or so. The matter would be a good thing or a bad thing, a birth or a death, a job change you want or one you don't want. But it's such a big deal that when you pray, it's one of the first things that come to mind. This situation devours so much of your attention that you need no prayer list to remind you to pray about it. If you're going to pray about your life, these six things are your life, aren't they? If you don't think so, how much of your life is not at all related to your family, your future, your finances, your work, or schoolwork, your, your, um, your Christian concerns, and the current crisis. These are the areas where you devote almost all of your time. Moreover, these are the great loves of your life, the places where your heart is. And thankfully, thing, these things don't change dramatically very often. Families, for example, don't experience the changes of marriages, births, and deaths month after month, year after year, year in and year out. While there may be frequent small changes in these areas, Really big changes in our family, work, etc. usually don't happen every week or every month. So if you're going to pray about your life, and if these six things are your life, and these things don't change significantly very often, that means you're going to pray about the same old things most of the time. That's normal. Next section says, saying the same old thing Saying the same old things is boring. Therefore, the problem is not the way we pray about the same old things. Rather, it's that we say the same old things about the same old things. It seems that virtually everyone begins to pray this way sooner or later, and it's boring. When, and when prayer is boring, we don't feel like praying. When we don't feel like praying, it's hard to pray, at least in any sort of focused, heartfelt way. That's when we're tempted to think, it must be me. <clears throat> I must be a second-rate Christian. The natural response to such discouragement can be, then stop it. Quit praying. Why do, why do this to yourself? If prayer is so boring and leaves you so frustrated and disheartened, then, why, then don't pray anymore. A true Christian would recoil, astonished at such a suggestion, no matter how boring a believer's prayer life is, no matter how few prayers are answered, no matter how deep the sense of failure in prayer, anyone indwelled by the Holy Spirit can never permanently give up prayer. That's the result of ongoing ministry in the third person of the Trinity, which is referring to by theologians as the preserving work of the Holy Spirit. Once the spirit of God brings people to spiritual life, he preserves them in that life, granting them the grace to perseverance in the evidence of that life, such as prayer. In other words, once the spirit causes a person to, to begin to cry, Abba Father, he continues creating God word looks and pleas 
in that person forever. So due to the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit, you believe in prayer and you really want to pray. But when you try to pray, it just feels like, well, like something's wrong. Then perhaps you hear a sermon on prayer or you hear a testimony answered about answered prayer or you read a book like this one on prayer. And for a while you go back to prayer, recommitted and rejuvenated, but basically still saying the same old things about the same old things, just with a bit more spiritual oomph behind it. Very soon though, the new enthusiasm evaporates and you find that saying the same old things about the same old things is as boring before um, as before. Only now you feel guiltier than ever because you had been so re resolved that things would be different this time. Once again, you return to what seems to be, seems the inevitable conclusion. It must be me. Something's wrong with me. It, I must be a second rate Christian. Now that was the first chapter called, chapter one called The Problem. Now the solution is really short is chapter two. And it starts with a quote by T.M. Moore. Nothing has brought more vigor, satisfaction and consistency to my own prayer, prayers as this single discipline. Is there a solution? If so, it has to be fundamentally simple since God invites indeed, if by his spirit he enables, all of his children to pray, then prayer must be essentially simple. God has children all over the world and as diverse as people can be from age nine to 99, some with low IQs, some with high IQs, some with no formal education and some with the highest levels of formal education. And most of them are ordinary folks, not primarily those whom the world considers intellectual or cultural elite. As Apostle Paul put it, consider your calling brothers, not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. That was 1 Corinthians 1 verse 26. This next section is entitled, every Christian can have a meaningful, satisfying prayer life. Although God doesn't choose many who are wise according to the worldly standards, he does call people from every imaginable circumstance and background. Our father draws to himself people with few Christian resources and people with many Christian resources, such as those who are, aren't able to even own a Bible and, who, and those who own many, those who do not live near a good, healthy church and those who experience rich fellowship and sound biblical exposition every two weeks, I mean, every week. Those who cannot read or who have no Christian books and those from whom many Christian books are readily available. Those who have no access to Christian teachings by, by means of various media and those who do. But if God invites and expects all of his children, regardless of their age, um, their IQ, education or resources to do the same thing, which is to pray, then prayer has to be simple. Therefore, it must be possible for every Christian, including every Christian reading this book, to have a meaningful, satisfying prayer life. For if you, with all your, children, all your Christian resources, presumably a Bible, a church family, the availability of Christian books, access to Christian teaching via the radio um, and the internet, and more. If you can't have a fulfilling prayer life in spite of all these helps, then what hope is there for our brothers and sisters in isolated locations, lands where non-Christian religious religions dominate or places of persecution where few, if any, of these Christian resources are available? Are you ready to say, well, that's pretty tight logic for if I, despite my education experience and all my Christian resources don't seem capable of meaningful, satisfying prayer life, then that necessarily implies that almost no Christian in the world can enjoy 
one either, since almost no follower of Jesus anywhere has as many of these helps for prayer as I. No, of course not. You'd never say that. Instead, you're more likely to think, look, I don't know anybody else. I just know when I pray, it's boring. So I must, so it must be me. There's something wrong with me. In fact, now that you've shown me all the advantages I have in comparison to many other Christians in the world, I feel guiltier than ever. I feel like a failure in prayer before, but apparently I'm even worse uh, than I thought. Thanks a lot. Boy, I'm sure glad that I picked this book. So now we've come to the most challenging part of this book. It's possible that you have been saying the same old things about the same old things in prayer for so long that it's hard for you to believe that you could easily learn to pray in any other way, as though you were listening to a lung specialist say that you can easily change the way you breathe. Many who are reading this book have endured the guilt of an incurable wandering mind and feelings of boredom in prayer for decades. And here comes a writer asking you to believe that there is a simple, permanent, biblical solution to a problem that's plagued you for the most of your life. Would I really ask you to believe that? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. I do realize that after all these years of unsatisfying prayer, you might find it challenging to believe that the problem is not you, Christian, but your method. But once again, let's return to the facts. The Lord has his people all over the world and among them are believers of every sort of demographic script description. And yet by his spirit, he gives to all of them a desire to pray. And yet by his, um, would he do this for all if meaningful prayer was doable only by some? Would your heavenly father make prayer so difficult or confusing that you can never enjoy it or rather never enjoy him through prayer? Despite his love for his people, a love demonstrated by the incarnation and crucifixion of his son for them, a love made evident by providing the Holy Spirit and the Bible and the church. Would he then devise a means of communion between himself and his children that most would find frustrating, boring monotony? That makes no sense. What does make sense is that the father who wanted to enjoy fellowship with all his children and wanted all his children to enjoy talking with him would make it simple for all of us to do. This, this next section, this last section of chapter two says, the simple permanent biblical solution. So what is the simple solution to boring routine, saying the same old things about the same old things? Here it is, when you pray, pray through a passive of scripture, particularly a Psalm. It probably didn't seem as dramatic as you were expecting. In fact, you may have heard something similar to this before. If so, it was most likely when someone teaching through one of the prayers of the Apostle Paul. Examples, Ephesians 1, 15 to 23, Ephesians 3, 14 to 21, Philippians 1, 9 through 11, said, we should pray these prayers today. And I agree, we should. Better yet, though I believe we should pray everything in Paul's letters, not just his prayers. The best place, however, for learning to pray through a passage of scripture is in the book of Psalms. And chapter three is the method. So we talked about the problem. Now he's talking about the solution and now it's the method. Let me take a drink. All right, there's a quote here by Gordon Winham. He says, the Psalms, they're designed to be prayed. Thank you. Now we're going to see what praying through a Psalm looks like. Let's use the 23rd Psalm as an example. 
And the name of the book is Praying the Bible by Donald S. Whitney. Now we're going to see what praying, praying through a Psalm looks like. Let's use the 23rd Psalm as an example. Let's say that as is probably true in real life, you read your Bible first. Perhaps you read in Matthew or in Hebrews, and then you turn to prayer. You decide to pray through a Psalm and you choose Psalm 23. You read the first verse, the Lord is my shepherd. And you pray something like this. Lord, I thank you that you are my shepherd. You are a good shepherd. You have shepherded me all my life. And great shepherd, please shepherd my life, my family today. Guard them from the ways of the world. Guide them into the ways of God. Lead them not into temptation. Deliver them from evil, O great shepherd. I pray for my children. Cause them to be your sheep. May they love you as a shepherd as I do. And Lord, please shepherd me in the decision that's before me about my future. Do I make that move, that change or not? I also pray for our under shepherds at the church. Please shepherd them as they shepherd us. That's good. And you continue praying anything else that comes to mind as you consider the words, the Lord is my shepherd. Then when nothing else comes to mind, you go to the next line. Wow, this is good. Um, you go to the next line, I shall not want. And perhaps you pray, Lord, I thank you that you, that I never really been in want. I haven't missed too many meals. All that I am and all that I have has come from you, but I know it pleases you that I bring my desires to you. So would you provide the finances that we need for those bills for school, for that car? Maybe you know someone who is in want and you pray for God's provision for him or her. Or you remember some of your, some of our persecuted brothers or sisters around the world and you pray for their concerns. After you finish, you look at the next verse. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. That's verse two. And frankly, when you read the words lie down, maybe what comes to mind is simply, Lord, I would be grateful if you would make it possible for me to lie down and take a nap today. Possibly the term green pastures makes you think of the feeding of God's flock in the green pastures of his word. And it prompts you to pray for a Bible teaching ministry you lead or for a teacher or a pastor who feeds you with the word of God. When was the last time you did that? Maybe you have never done that, but praying through this Psalm caused you to do so. Next, you read, he leads me beside the still waters. That's the second half of verse two. And maybe you begin to plead and you say, yes, Lord, do lead me in, the, in that decision. I have to make about my future. I want to do what you want, oh Lord, but I don't know what that is. Please lead me into your will in this matter and lead me beside the still waters in this, please quiet the anxious waters in my soul about this situation. Let me experience your peace. Maybe the turbulence in my heart be still. Well, may the turbulence in my heart be still by trust in you and your sovereignty over all things and over all people. Following that, you read verse, the, read the, these words from verse three. He restores my soul. That prompts you to pray along the lines of, my shepherd, I come to you spiritually dry today. Please restore my soul. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. I pray you restore the soul of what that person from work, school, down the street, with whom I'm hoping to share the gospel. 
Please restore his soul from darkness to light, from death to life. You cannot continue praying in this way until either one, you run out of time, or two, you run out of the psalm. And if you run out of the psalm, before you run out of time, you simply turn the page and go to, song, go to another psalm. By doing so, you never run out of anything to say and the best of all, you never again say the same old things about the same old things. So basically, what you are doing is taking words that originated in the heart and mind of God and circulating them through your heart and mind back to God. By this, by this means his words become the wings of your prayers. This is some good stuff. The next chapter is more about the method. And there is a quote from John Piper and it opens up and says, open the Bible, start reading it and pause at every verse and turn it into a prayer. To pray the Bible, you simply go through the passage line by line, talking to God about whatever comes to mind as you read the text. See how easy it is. See how easy it is? Anyone can do that. If you don't understand the meaning of, the, of a verse, go to the next verse. If the meaning of that one is perfectly clear, but nothing comes to mind to pray about, go on to the next verse. Just speak to the Lord about everything that occurs to you as you slowly read his word. You do this even if, and this passage of the book is potentially the one most likely to be misunderstood. Even if what comes to mind has nothing to do with the text. Now, let me defend that biblically. What does the text of scripture tell us to pray about? Everything, right? The Bible tells us that in Philippians 4 and 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, be prayer by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. We may bring everything by prayer to God. Everything is something we may pray about. Every person, every object, every issue, every circumstance, every fear, every situation. Everything in the universe is something we may bring before God. So every thought that enters your mind as you are reading a passage of scripture, even if that thought has nothing to do with the text before you at that moment is something that you may bring to God. This next session is interpreting the Bible versus praying the Bible. I wanna make a crucial distinction between what I wrote in the previous paragraph and interpreting the Bible accurately. A process formerly known as hermeneutics, correctly handling the word of God does not permit making the text say what we want. And hermeneutics is spelled H-E-R-M-E-N-E-U-T-I-C-S. So look it up if you get a chance. To understand the Bible accurately, which is essentially for right belief and living, for truthful sharing with others, and for authoritative teaching and preaching, we must do whatever is necessary to discover or ex, ex, exegete, I'm not saying a word right, E-X-E-G-E-T-E, -E -E, the single in God-inspired meaning of every verse before us. The text of the Bible means what God inspired to me, what, what God inspired it to me, not what it means to me. When we come to the Bible on all other occasions, I can think of our primary purpose is to understand and apply it. So let's say we're doing Bible study. Primarily, we're putting the, in the mental effort and perhaps physical effort too, if we are using other reference tools to understand what the text before us says and means. Secondarily, we are praying, Lord, 
we might ask from time to time, what does this mean? Or occasionally pray, how do I apply this? As I said, this, as I said, that's our mindset, more or less on almost all occasions when we come to the Bible, whether it's deeper level of the Bible or simply the daily reading of one or more chapters of scripture. That's not what we're doing here. With that, with what I am advocating, our primary activity is prayer, not Bible intake. Bible reading is secondary in this process. Our focus is on God through prayer. Our glance is at the Bible and we turn Godwardly and pray about every matter that occurs to us as we read. Do you see the distinction? Let me use a ridiculous illustration to make the point. Suppose you're praying through Psalms 130 and you come to a verse you come to verse three. If you or Lord should mark iniquities, O Lord, who can stand? And when you see that verb, mark, your friend Mark comes to mind. What should you do? Pray for Mark? You know that verse is not about Mark, but it's certainly not wrong to pray for Mark just because he popped into your head as you were reading Psalms 130 verse three. Here's a more realistic illustration. Let's return to a verse from which we prayed a few moments ago, Psalms 23 verse three. He restores my soul. I said that one of the things this verse might prompt you to pray for is the salvation of a person whom you're trying to share the gospel to pray that God will restore that person's soul from darkness to light, from death to life. If I were to preach on Psalms 23 and say, this verse is about evangelism, about God restoring the souls of those in spiritual darkness, I would be sinning. That verse is not about evangelism and I know it. It's about a believer's soul being restored to the joy of God's salvation. Were I, were I to declare to others that God's word here means one thing, when I know it means another, would be at best to misuse the text. Whenever we have the right to claim that the Bible says something it does not, uh, whenever, we never, sorry, we never have the right to claim that the Bible says something that it does not. But if while you are praying through Psalms 23 verse three, your non-Christian friend comes, comes to mind and you use the language of the verse to say, Lord, restore my friend's soul, restore him from darkness to light, from death to life, that's fine. This isn't reading something into the text. It's merely using the language of the text to speak to God about what has come into your mind. So again, simply turn every thought Godward as you read the passage. At some point, you'll pray exactly what the text is about as when you pray. Lord, restore my soul to the joy of your salvation. At other, at other times, you will use the biblical language to pray thoughts unrelated to the text that come to you while reading the text as in, Lord, restore, my non-Christian friend's soul from death to life. This is life-changing right now. I am so blessed by this, it's unbelievable. And I, I hope you are too. This is game changer right here. All right, this next section is confidence in the word and the spirit. I have enough confidence in the word and the spirit of God to believe that if, if people will pray in this way in the long run, their prayers will be far more biblical than if they just make up their own prayers. That's what people usually do, make up their own prayers. That's, uh, what's the result of that? What is the, re what's the result? We tend to say the same old things about the same old things. And without the scripture to shape our prayers, we are, far more, we are far more likely to pray in unbiblical ways. 
Whoa, that's 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 deep right there. <sighs> we are far more likely to pray in unbiblical ways than if we pray the thoughts that occur to us as we read the scripture. So while it's true that people may use this method and pray about things that are not found in the text, I contend that will happen much less if people will pray while reading the text. By this means, the Spirit of God will use the Word of God to help the people of God pray increasingly according to the will of God. And someone in the chat is saying, that's why it's important to read, then pray. Amen. Um, I think it's important enough to say it again, regardless of how far from the true meaning of the text people's mind, minds and therefore their prayers may wander. I have enough confidence in the word and the spirit of God to believe that if people will pray in this way, in the long run, their prayers will be far more biblical than if they just make up their own prayers. Moreover, is there any better way for people to learn the true meaning of the text if they are alone with the Holy Spirit and the Bible, then that Bible, than to pray over the text? The godly 19th century Scottish pastor, Robert Murray McChaney, um, affirmed this when he said, Turn the Bible into prayer. The best way of knowing the meaning of the Bible and, learn, and of learning to pray. In reality, I think that the most of the time people will pray fairly close to the true meaning of the text. For if they don't understand a verse while praying through the passage, they will probably move on to the next verse that they do understand. I've given these illustrations not to excuse someone's laziness in handling the text, but rather to show that even in the case when a person prays about a matter far removed from the proper interpretation of the text, it's acceptable to speak to God about such matters. People should feel free to pray about whatever comes to mind as they read through a passage of scripture. This next section is titled, A Simple Method. That's it. If you are praying through a psalm, you simply read the psalm line by line, talking to God about whatever thoughts are prompted by the inspired words you read. If your mind wanders from the subject of the text, take those wandering thoughts, Godward, and then return to the text. If you come to a verse you don't understand, just skip it and go to the next verse. If you don't understand, that one, move on. If you don't understand it, but nothing comes to mind, then pray about, to pray about, go to the next verse. If sinful thoughts enter in, pray about them and go on. You may read 20 or 30 verses in the Psalm and get on a given day, have only five or six things come to mind. No problem. Nothing says you have to pray over every verse. Nothing says you have to finish the psalm. I was teaching this method at a church in Santa Rosa, California, and gave the people an opportunity to try praying through a passage of scripture. One woman prayed for 25 minutes and never got past the Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> for nearly half an hour, she talked to the Lord about those five words. Do you think that in heaven, the Lord was saying in a huff, Did, you didn't finish the Psalm? No, I think he was delighted that he found so much delight in him as her shepherd that she could talk to him for 25 minutes about that, regardless of whether she prayed through the rest of the Psalm. At other times though, and this is probably more common, you will go through many verses and only a few matters will come to mind. Fine, just keep turning the page. Um, this next section is entitled, The Impactory Psalms. 
you'll come to those sections known as the Im oh, impeccatory, oops, impeccatory psalm. Those passages where the psalmist calls for God's judgment upon his people. People are presumed to be God's enemies. But how do you pray through a psalm when it contains verses like this? Blessed be he who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. Psalms 137 verse nine. Oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. Psalms 58 verse six. Let them be like the snail that dissolves into slime. Psalms 58 verse eight. Well, maybe there's someone at work for whom you are tempted momentarily to pray such things, but it's difficult to do with pure motive, isn't it? While I believe those sections of scriptures are inspired as fully as John 3.16 and any other part of the Bible, I don't think we should pray verses like these with specific people in mind. To do that would be hard to reconcile with Jesus' command in Matthew 5, 55, 44, and 45. Love your, quote, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be the sons of your father who is in heaven, end quote. I do think we can put specific sins in those passages, praying that God will smash their teeth as they attempt to devour our souls. I sometimes pray angrily that all the enemies of God be born a God of, oh, sorry. Some, I sometimes pray angrily that all the enemies of God born in my sinful heart um, will be destroyed as thoroughly as these impeccatory Psalms describe. I also believe we can pray these imprecations against national sins as I sometimes do. For example, against abortion and racism. Ultimately, as we view the scriptures Christ, Christocentrically, we can put such Psalms in the mouth of Jesus. Someday he is going to do far worse than just break the teeth in their mouth, in the mouth of his life long. I'm sorry, I couldn't read that right. Someday, he is going to do far worse than just break the teeth in the mouth of his lifelong unrepentant enemies. Essentially, we can pray these Psalms in such a way that reflects the attitude, quote, Lord, I am on your side and against all your enemies. I want your justice and righteousness to win the final victory over sin and rebellion against you, end quote. But let's say one day, week as you are, um, oh, so, but let's say one day next week, as you are praying through a psalm, you come to one of these sections. You might think, hmm, that Whitney guy in the book on praying the Bible said, we could pray through these kind of psalms, but I don't remember what he said. That's okay. Maybe you'll pray, Lord, what does this mean? Or please show me how to pray from this passage. Perhaps you move past the entire section and go to the next verse that gives you clear direction in prayer. Any of this is fine. That's why this method is so simple and anyone can do it. Uh, this next section is titled, Some of the Benefits. It's not only easy to begin praying with this method. This method makes it easy to continue in prayer. The basic spirituality course I teach in seminary is called Personal Spiritual Disciplines. On the first day of class, I announced that once during the semester, each student is to spend four consecutive hours alone with God. When I say this, the concern I really, I read on many faces tells me that they're thinking, what am I gonna do for four hours? But after I teach them how to meditate on the scripture, and how to pray through a passage of scripture, most of them spend the entire four hours alternating between those two activities, sometimes writing the meditations or, or prayers in a journal. What's so encouraging is that nearly all the students spend more than four hours 
on the assignment. Not because they have to, but because they are enjoying it so much and they don't want to stop. Many of them walk while praying through the Psalm. And if they reach the end of the Psalm, but want to keep walking and praying, they simply turn the page and continue praying. Praying the Bible in this way is so practical because it expands or contracts to accommodate however much or how little time you have for prayer. So it works if you have four hours like those students. And yet it works if you have just four minutes. If you only have four minutes, you won't get very far in the text, but you can still pray the Bible. Conversely, if you have four hours for prayer, you just keep turning the page. No matter how long you pray, you never run out of things to pray when you pray the Bible. Even better is the fact that when you pray through a passage of scripture, you, do, you don't pray empty repetitive praise, phrases. Talk to God about the words you read in the Bible and you never again pray the same old things about the same old thing. That alone is worth the time you've invested in reading this book, isn't it? But it gets even better than that. Because the words you use when you pray, the prayer, the, oh, sorry, because the words you use when you pray the Bible are not just fresh new phrases you haven't used in prayer before as, energized, as energizing as it is. Praying, <clears throat> From the word of God means your prayers include inspired words, as Joni Erickson Tada explains. And she says, I have learned to season my prayer with the word of God. It's always, it's a way of talking to God in his language, speaking his dialect, using his vernacular, employing his idioms. This is not a matter simply of divine vocabulary. It's a matter of power. When we bring God's word directly into our praying, we are bringing God's power into our prayers. Hebrews 4 verse 12 declares, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. God's word is living and so it infuses our prayers with life and vitality. God's word is also active, injecting energy, power into our prayer. There's a supernatural quality to the words of the scripture that you pray, Jesus said, the words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. That was John 6, verse 63. When you pray, the Bible, you aren't just praying ordinary words. You are praying words of spirit and life. And I will stop there. And that was the first four chapters of the book, Praying the Bible. And the first chapter was the problem. The second chapter was the solution. The third chapter was the method. And the fourth chapter was more about the method. So hopefully I get to read um, the rest of that. I hope that blessed you. I know this is, that's not um, a traditional Sunday morning service, but I am enriched right now. I really uh, feel God and I'm excited now about my next prayer session. Um, I, I, I feel like I've just been in a seminary class. So, um, well, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I am uh, truly grateful to be able to share and to learn right now um, with you, Sister Roxanne. And um, I just bless the Lord. I just give him thanks and praise. He's an amazing, amazing God. And um, you know, I'm excited about what he's going to do uh, coming soon, and I'm, I'm excited. I think I'm going to start with that Psalm 23 and uh, pray that. We'll see. We'll see. I may be that, like that lady praying 25 minutes or five words. Amen. So um, 
I pray the Lord will continue to bless you this week and um, hopefully you'll be able to um, soak in what we, what I just read and uh, apply that. And maybe the both of us will have a life-changing experience and anyone um, watching this, um, I pray that it's not just vain words beating into the air, but words of life application that will help shape and mold and change your prayer life and style forever. Amen. And I uh, just want to thank you for um, your continued support financially. And um, I pray that the Lord will bless your, your um, finances for your giving and whatever you decide to give. Of course, you give it with your heart and you, whatever your purpose to give um, for the upbuilding of this work that the Lord has placed on us. Amen. And a way to give is via Cash App and it's dollar sign MHJ Kogop. And um, um, if you want to mail in um, a donation, you can mail it to P.O. Box 14253, Albany, New York, 12212. Thank you kindly for participating with us. God bless you. We love you. May God go with you this week and give you peace and a new inspired prayer life. Amen.